this is Dana Hall, and I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Tim Timothy Volk, V-O-L-K, a professor at SUNY ESF. And Tim, I'm quickly trying to scramble to find, aha, there it is. Um, so Dr. Volk has 30 years worth of experience in um, working in the fields of forestry, agroforestry, and Tim maybe explain what agroforestry is, uh, short rotation woody crops, bioenergy, and phytoremediation in the Northeast of this country, as well as in West Africa. Um, Tim, I invited, I, I invited you to tell us about the, uh, what I call the Willow Farm down in Tully and its uh, various research projects and, and how uh, people learn about the results and benefit from the results. And uh, also talk to us please about the uh, crop of a couple kinds of willows that you helped plant and made all the arrangements for providing and so forth along the Nest Brook this past, I think it was early March. So um, Tim, without further ado, I'll hand the meeting over to you and and do you want to be interrupted by questions as you go along or would you like us to wait till you're finished? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to have a conversation. So at any point you've got a question, just jump in. If we don't get through all the stuff I've got, it's not like we got to get through it all. Um, I got lots of pictures, but so at any point you want to you want to make a comment, uh, have a question, please, by all means, just just jump in. Not at all bothered by that. So I'm just going to I'll uh, share my screen here. It worked when we did it before. OK, can you folks see that? Looks good. OK, I can't see you anymore, so I'm talking to the screen, but so just jump, so, so I can't see you waving your hand because I'm in picture mode here in PowerPoint. So just speak up if you got a question, okay? Um, so here's, here's the things that I was gonna talk about tonight when I chatted with Dana. And Dana, thanks for the opportunity to come in and uh, share with you and the group here. Uh, you asked me to just give you a little bit about my background and a little about ESF and how it's structured and what programs we have. So I will do that. Uh, and then I threw in a couple of slides about the latest IPCC climate change assessment. So this just came out at the beginning of August. I'll be honest, there's a lot to digest. I won't digest all of it. I'm not a climate scientist by any means, but I've been using it in my classes. So I just thought I'd share a few key messages from that because I think carbon is driving much of what we're doing both in energy and land management and will going forward here in New York State with some of the legislation that's in place. I'll talk a little bit about biomass. Where does it fit into this overall issue of trying to ad address carbon balances around the world uh, and in the state? And, and from that, then I'll slide into talking about willow. And I've been doing willow for decades now. I can talk a long time about willow, but I'll just share a little bit of information with you about some of the things we've done. And again, at any point, happy to answer questions. I'll talk a little bit. Uh, about other ecosystem services and in terms of energy. So I'll talk about Van Esbrook, some nutrient filter work, a couple other things like that where we're using Willow in different applications. So a little bit about me. I actually, I grew up in downtown Toronto. I was born outside of Washington, DC, but my dad got moved when I was an infant. So I grew up in Toronto. So that's the red dot here, uh, just on the north side of Lake Ontario. I think a key point for me was when I was a junior in high school, I spent a summer up here at this red dot. So I was at a junior forest ranger program that was run by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources up here in this, it doesn't even have a town. We were literally 65 miles from the nearest crossroads uh, up this dirt road into the boreal forest. So a bit of a shock for a kid from Toronto, but, um, you know, I loved it. For me, it was pivotal. Uh, it really convinced me I needed, I wanted to study and do something in the natural resources, forestry type of field. So um, that, that was important for me. I often use that with students and tell them to grab those opportunities when you can, because, you know, for me, it was eight weeks in a summer. And if I'd gotten up there and just had really not liked it, it was eight weeks, right? It wasn't a long commitment. Uh, but for me, it actually turned the corner and, and helped me 
uh, see opportunities that I probably wasn't aware of from downtown Toronto. Uh, I did an undergrad in natural resources at the Ag College uh, the, at the University of Guelph, uh, which is the Ontario's agricultural school, much like Cornell is here. I then went down to Cornell and studied forest science. After that, I went, uh, my wife and I went and lived and worked in, in Nigeria and West Africa for about three and a half years. So I did, the picture here shows you a project I was working on with a community trying to plant trees on old abandoned tin mines. <clears throat> and so there were a lot of them around. There was a lot of tin mining in central Nigeria from when the British were there and we were trying to restore these and turn them into somewhat productive landscapes for communities again. I still go back periodically to West Africa. I haven't been back, of course, with COVID now for a couple of years, but was going every, every year or two, uh, working on various projects still over there. I quite enjoy uh, the people and the opportunity to go there. When I came back from West Africa, um, so the reality is I couldn't find a job in my field. So I went back to school. Um, so I ended up going back to ESF. Uh, I met some great people there who gave me an opportunity to study Willow. And that's really what started my career in this field. <clears throat> and then got hired on there and I've been there for a number of years. So I've been at ESF since 97. I'm, I'm a faculty member in the Sustainable Resource Management Department. That's a name change that occurred recently. It used to be the Forest and Natural Resources Management, but we have since incorporated construction management and a sustainable energy management program into that department. And so a name change was sort of warranted. We've grown, we still have forestry and natural resources management and forest ecosystem science in our department, but there was a need for a little broader name. So that's the name change. And I do work on, on many of these things Dana mentioned at the beginning. So woody biomass production, sustainability, these systems. Um, the bioeconomy is a big thing. Anything related to biomass production, using biology to uh, work things in the economy is becoming a, a growing area. And we're starting some work around that. Agroforestry is really the idea of integrating uh, trees, shrubs, um, and livestock together in uh, managed landscapes. So you could be doing, you know, grazing in systems with trees. It could be strip cropping of trees or intentional management of trees in or around the edges of fields. Uh, nut cropping, uh, tree nut cropping often falls in there. So lots of, it's just ways to integrate different types of land management that include, intentionally include shrubs and trees. So lots of different systems that people are looking at there. You know, windbreaks, living snow fences or other things around here in central New York that often fall into those categories that are used. I teach uh, classes for the Sustainable Energy Management Program. We also have a renewable energy option in our environmental science program that I coordinate. Uh, so that's something that's grown in the last few years quite a bit uh, with the changes in where we are on energy issues. So that's been kind of exciting and, and the students are great. I really, uh, I really enjoy working with students. They always bring different and new perspectives. Uh, so it's always, I always enjoyed it. And, and I am so glad we're back in person. I, I discovered I am not an online uh, instructor. That's not my forte. I really appreciate the interaction with students. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about ESF, right? Uh, the college likes to promote itself as one of the premier colleges in the States for the study of anything related to the environment, both the built and natural environment. And I'll just give you a little bit about how we're structured. So we're a small college within the SUNY system. So we are part of the State University of New York, and I'll touch on that in a minute when I talk about history. We have somewhere around 17 undergrads and 400 grad students, so it's not a huge student population. We're nestled in beside Syracuse University. We were part of Syracuse University for quite a while, uh, and then were separated out into the state system. And we uh, prepare students for both professional degrees, things like engineering, landscape architecture, forestry, which are considered more professional training degrees, as well as more traditional academic uh, pursuits in the, in the STEM field. So just a little bit of the history and the background of ESF. Uh, this picture at the top is Gray Hall. This was the first building uh, 
uh, built in about 1917 on the campus, still there, the main administration building on campus. ESF was founded as the New York State College of Forestry back in 1911. So we're, we're 110 or so years old at this point in time. It was originally part of Syracuse University. Um, we then also in 1912 opened a range, the Ranger School up in Wanakina in the Adirondacks. That program still runs and we train. That's a two year program for forestry technicians surveying and natural resources conservation. Uh, and they can, students can do two years there and come to campus do another two years or many of them like out of the surveying program and stuff, they've got lots of job offers right out of that two year program. Uh, the first women from ESF graduated actually in pulp and paper and landscape recreation. That was in, in the mid 1940s. And in 1948, when the SUNY system was built, the College of Forestry got pulled out of Syracuse University and set up within the State University of New York. Actually, up until the mid to late 1990s, students graduated with a joint degree from Syracuse University and ESF because of that past history. That's no longer the case. It's just SUNY ESF, but uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting history and it continues to be a strong relationship uh, between the two campuses. 72 is the last major name change for the college, from the College of Forestry to the College of Environmental Science and Forestry to highlight and emphasize the environmental science and the issues that were cropping up in the early 1970s. The bottom picture in contrast to Bray Hall at the top, this is the lead Platinum Gateway building uh, that's maybe now five or six years old. That's the most recent building on campus. Okay, we've got, uh, there's seven departments on campus uh, that serve the students and they're listed there. And then there's one interdisciplinary, what we call a division. So it's not a department in the structure we have. And it, what it does is draws on faculty from all the departments. And it's the environmental science division. One of the things that ESF likes to tout is they're probably one of the largest uh, colleges in terms of land base, um, potentially anywhere in the world. There's 25,000 acres that ESF manages and is part of uh, a scattering of campuses. So we have the main campus in Syracuse. We have a small research station in Lafayette. We got about a little over 4,000 acres in Heiberg. There's a small research station in Thousand Islands. And then these locations up here is where the vast majority, up in the Adirondacks, we got four stations and there's lots of land associated with those that are used for a variety of educational programs, uh, research and other activities. So just quickly, undergrad and grad programs, about 29 different undergraduate programs, plus these two year degrees that I mentioned, you can get up at the Ranger School up in Wanakina. And there's about 31 different graduate programs. And we have graduate programs that do MPSs or a Master of Professional Studies. That would be, that's like doing an MBA, but you do an MPS in forestry, you do an MPS in sustainable energy or an MPS in engineering. Uh, so a non-research um, master's degree, more professional. And then an MS and PhD is also offered in most of these programs. So we're one of a handful of PhD granting institutions within the SUNY system. Most of the other places are much larger. So University of Buffalo, Binghamton, Stony Brook, places like that, that are much larger schools, Albany. We do research all over the world. So the map at the top gives you an idea of smattering of where faculty have research. We do all research in all kinds of areas, almost all of it related in some way to the environment uh, or the natural world around us. Um, we have 26 specialized centers, right? So there's these niches where we have very specialized work that uh, um, are there. So I see somebody in the waiting room. Oh, somebody admitted them. Okay, I didn't know if I, being the moderator, needed to do that. So things that you may have heard about, uh, American Chestnut, there's a Center for American Chestnut Work, the effort to restore American Chestnut. We've got a Native Peoples and the Environment. We've got the Great Lakes Research Consortium, lots of others, but there are specialized areas of research. And uh, that's why we set up centers uh, to focus on those. Okay, any questions about that before I shift gears here and talk about the IPCC? 
Uh, yeah, Tim, this is Dana. I, I've written down three so far. Um, maybe they're short answers, I hope. Um, over in West Africa, you talked about reclaiming um, old tin mining areas. How successful has that been? Is that soil or those spoils so, um, are they suitable to grow anything? Yeah, they don't grow, uh, you know, so these were largely surface mines, but the pits were often excavated down to 40 to 60 feet, I'd say. And so it's the stuff from the bottom that ends up on the top of the piles, of course. So it's not good soil by any means. Uh, so we worked on, we, I worked with communities to try different trees that they were most interested in. None of the food, like fruit, fruit type trees were very successful, like right? they tend to be a little more demanding, but we did find a bunch of trees, especially if we mixed in, you know, some uh, cow manure or some sort of organic amendment as part of the tree planting process. So there were a few communities that were quite successful in getting tree plantings going on these, um, on some of these mine spoils. Not clear to me how far it spread beyond that, uh, but at least we, I think we set up the system with some communities so that they had the information and experience to be able to move it forward as they wanted to. Okay, now you want to entertain another question or two? Or um, so, so you mentioned the lead platinum building on at the ESF campus. So that's a that implies to me a fully self-sustained sustaining building. Is that? Is that the case there? Um, yeah, so, you know, LEED is a system of scoring new buildings, right? And platinum is the highest score you can get. And it includes a whole bunch of things. Uh, the materials, you, the types of materials you use in the building, the, the energy efficiency of the building, uh, the sources of energy in the building. So one of the things is that in that building, there is a combined heat and power system in the basement. And it, it actually makes it a, the building's a net negative energy because it produces way more energy than is used in the building. It provides about 60% um, of the heat and 20% of the electricity that we use on campus out of that building. And there's a, one of the things that's appealing to me as a biomass person is there's a, there's a biomass system. There's also a natural gas system, right? We need a little more flexibility than biomass gives you, but there is a biomass combined heat and power system in the basement as well. So yes, that energy, oh, and it's a, a very energy efficient building, right? So the, the energy used per square foot is really low relative to most other buildings. That was, that's intentional as part of the design. Okay, thanks, Tim. I, uh, I'll go quiet. Before, before we part company this evening, maybe you can tell us more about um, American Chestnut and fundamentally whether uh, the research going on is gonna bring them back, but I, I don't, don't answer that now. I don't wanna monopolize the conversation necessarily. Okay, so a couple, any other questions? Okay, great. A, a couple comments about this uh, sixth IPCC assessment that came out at the beginning of August. So this is, this is pretty new stuff. Again, I'm not a climate scientist. This first report is, is about the climate science behind their assessments. Um, there'll be other two other key reports coming out. One is about the, the impacts associated with different um, projections on where we may go in the future. And then there'll be one on, the third one will be on um, how do we mitigate climate? Uh, how do we mitigate increases in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere going forward? So this one really just was again, coming back around uh, and again, these quotes, right, I'm pulling these off of the IPCC website. Uh, they have these set up that you can make use of. So, you know, it, it's, it's clear now that we're rapidly changing the amount of CO2 and the climate uh, here on Earth. And the next piece of that is that, I'll come back to this, but the next piece is that it's human activities, right, are contributing to this rapid change that's occurring. And those, and the changes that are occurring, right? We have much better documentation and it's getting clearer all the time that heat waves, changes in precipitation patterns, droughts uh, are all becoming more severe 
and more extreme when they do occur. Okay, so there's, there's information documenting that. I'll just show you this one piece of data. You know, one thing about these reports is that there's lots of information behind them. They try and distill them into these figures, but even so these figures, well, they take me a while to digest before I understand what's going on. But I, I'll just share this one. This is a this is global surface temperatures. So what we have here, can you see my cursor moving? No. Nope. Uh, yes. Okay, I can't see you. So uh, the way my screen is set up, because I had to pull yeah, your cursor. Your, I think your cursor right then is done around 500 or 1,000. Yes, or okay, yes. great. Yep. So on this x-axis, this is time, right? Back 2,000 years up to the present to 2020. And here is temperature change. So what's the baseline for this? The baseline is from 1850 to 1900. So that's what they use as the baseline zero um, temperature. What they've done is to the left here, they've reconstructed temperature patterns <clears throat> using things like ice cores and other historical documentation uh, in the natural environment that they're able to extract and correlate with temperature. This shows you what kind of fluctuations have been in temperature over the last couple of thousand years. The gray line in the middle is 10 year averages and then there's noise in all this data. So that's what the gray around it is. From 1850 to, two, to 2020, that's, this is what has happened to temperature now in the last 170 years. So this little slice is actually the graph on the right, same thing, but this is just changing the scale to go from 1850 to 2020. So what has happened to temperature in the last 70 years? So that's the black line, that's observed data, right? That's been collected around the world for the last 170 years. And that's what it shows you about the pattern that's happened to temperature. They've then, in the modeling efforts that they do, deconstructed the impact of natural events. So things like solar flares, solar events, volcanic activity, any of those other sort of natural events that contribute to climate change, and have tracked that and projected back in time, actually. That green line is telling you what would happen. If we just had these natural events, we'd probably still be hovering down here around the same temperature. But that's not the case. Human activity has actually, that's the brown line, contributed lots of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And we have now changed the temperature relative to 1850 to 1900. We're seeing a little over a degree Celsius change in the temperature. Okay, so this is occurring. There's a whole bunch of stuff in this report about what are the impacts, right, in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of heat and temperature, precipitation, uh, and drought are the big three that they highlight. There's other stuff in there, but those are the three key. And we're having impact. So just think about the forest fires in the Western US, right? That's been a pattern now for a number of years of those becoming more intense. And while there's lots of factors that contribute to forest fires, right? Our forest management, you know, Smokey the Bear has been one of the best public service campaigns ever. But when you have forest systems that naturally burned on 10 to 20 year cycles at a low level and you stop doing that, you build up fuel. So we've got a fuel issue. We've got a lot more people interfacing in the forest, right? Which is contributing to some of it. But there's no doubt at this point that the changing climate, the hotter, drier weather that occurs out West is another factor that's playing into. And again, it's the size and extreme nature of these that is often uh, the challenge. Okay. So there's lots of other things we could talk about around there. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to, but the message is clear. We need to take action. And, and I really put this in here because this, the biomass work that I'm gonna talk about is important as an important part of the solution going forward. It's not, there's no silver bullet. I like to talk about silver buckshot. There's lots of little things that we have to do. Biomass is one of the pieces. So let me show you one set of data. This is actually from the last IPCC report on solutions or mitigation and what they've got here. So this is where we're at on the left axis here. We're at 40 billion tons of CO2 or 40 gigatons of CO2 emissions every year, right? We've got to stop increasing this and start decreasing this. 
they created four scenarios on how we could bend this curve, right? So think about this line of the, the dark green line is the net CO2. And these are four scenarios. This is scenario on this left is dramatic reduction in energy consumption starting now. This one is more sort of a business as usual for the next 15 to 20 years. And then we start taking drastic action. These are two in between. Again, we could talk about these a lot. The thing that I wanna show you is that in all of these, this brown piece down here, AFOLU, agri uh, agriculture, forestry, and other land use. So when people talk about planting trees, improved forest management, better management of agricultural systems to store more carbon, that's where all this occurs. And you can see in all of these scenarios, what happens is that land management component goes from being a net emitter of carbon to rapidly becoming a sequester or a store of carbon. And in some of these scenarios, it's a fairly a large piece. This one out here at this end is the least rapid to make that change. The other piece is this yellow piece, right? And this is biomass, what's called BEX, bio, bio, uh, bioenergy carbon capture and storage. And I've got a slide in a minute that I'm gonna show you basically what that is. But the key in all these three scenarios to reach a reasonable level, two degrees uh, limit warming to two degrees C, we need biomass. And, and in this one, it's extreme and large. That, uh, we don't want to go down that route, not likely to take a lot of land. But if these ones even here, we're talking several, several million square kilometers of land that need to be used for biomass that then go into these BEC systems. So this is where willow is one small example of biomass might fit into these kind of systems. So what is BEX? So here's the basic idea of BEX. So what are plants doing? Plants are pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, right? So we've got these organisms all over the landscape that are actually pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere for us. It's then what we do with those plants and how that CO2 cycles that then becomes part of the question. The idea is BEX is you grow biomass uh, and then you use it and use it to generate some sort of usable energy. So this could be heat, it could be combined heat and power. More likely it's gonna be a facility that's gonna produce things like biofuels and the biofuels probably that are most likely to be needed going forward. It's not ethanol for cars, we're gonna electrify I think a lot of our system, but it's things like renewable diesel for trucks and boats and then sustainable aviation fuel. And they've already been flying planes on aviation fuel made from biomass. If you do that here, right, in that process, there's going to be CO2 that's generated as you convert that biomass to another fuel. What the idea is, is you capture that CO2. Instead of emitting it up the stack, you capture it and you bury it below ground. So the trees have taken it out of the atmosphere. A portion of that carbon goes here and through to a fuel that we then use in our energy systems. And a portion of the carbon that's been captured gets put away and stored below ground or in some other sorts of system long-term. Okay, so this actually gives you, if you did an analysis or added up all the positive emissions and negative capturing, these systems would end up producing energy and a storage of carbon at the same time. So we want energy to keep our systems running, um, but we also need to address the carbon. So this is one way to do that. Okay. So let's talk about where biomass fits in and then willow as an example of biomass. I should go back to this slide, I can't resist. So this is in the US, this is where our energy comes from right now. So I'm an energy guy, I study this stuff. So uh, this is actually 92, 93 quads, what we call quads of BTUs, quadrillion BTUs in 2020. This is down about 8%, 8 to 9% from 2019, right? That's the pandemic impact on our energy system. Here's the mix of fuels that we use to run our economy, right? So petroleum, natural gas, and coal making about 80% of all the energy. Renewables are only 12 at this point. This pie is gonna to have to grow dramatically. 
when we look at renewable energy, people often talk about solar and wind, right, as the main ones. And these are important and these are growing rapidly, right? Hydroelectric is large. Biomass actually makes up a large portion, about 40% of all the renewable energy currently used in the United States comes from biomass. People often don't um, uh, grasp this, right? Biomass is sort of what in these hidden renewable energy sources that doesn't get the same attention. It, it, so it's more complicated than wind and solar in many ways and harder for people to understand. But I just put that up there to, to show that we are already using quite a bit of biomass and renewable energy systems. This is gonna grow in the future, just like wind and solar and geothermal will. We're pretty well tapped out on hydroelectric at any scale here in the United States. This pie is gonna have to grow. We're gonna have to use less fossil fuels to address climate change. Okay. So what is biomass? I, one way to think about biomass is it's stored solar energy, right? So, you know, it's the sun through the photosynthesis process, right? You take up some carbon dioxide, you give it some water, you add sunlight, and plants turn those very basic compounds into complex molecules, right? That we can use for all sorts of things. Think about the kinds of medicines, complicated products we get out of plants, right? So they're taking CO2 out and they're storing carbon, but they're also storing energy, right? So I, I often talk about them as being uh, solar storage systems, solar energy storage systems, right? And then we can use them when we need it, or we just leave the energy and the carbon stored there. Okay, so the Department of Energy has done this assessment we could produce a billion tons of biomass in the United States sustainably. And that's a whole other discussion about how you define sustainably and how they did this assessment. But one of the things is, if we, if we think about this also as homegrown energy, then it's got a lot of other benefits, jobs, right? And um, reductions in CO2 and uh, biofuels that then create think of uh, cash flows and build rural economies and lots of other benefits. So this is this idea of a bioeconomy, right? It's the biomass as the base, but it's all the other things that occur around it to create an economy, right? With this homegrown renewable energy. Okay, lots of energy. So in, in this billion tons, where is it gonna come from? Ag residues, forests, uh, Biological waste streams, so think uh, dairy manure, organic fraction or municipal solid waste. There'll be some algae likely in the system going forward. And there's this thing called energy crops. So energy crops are crops that are grown typically on marginal agricultural land, low quality agricultural land. And they're grown primarily for their energy. There's a whole bunch of these. So here's willow that I'm gonna talk to you about now. Poplar, uh, there's grasses like miscanthus or switchgrass that can be grown in lots of different places. Down south, they're growing energy cane and eucalyptus. So lots of different types of crops that will depend on where you are in the state. We'll come back to this map to show you where willow could be grown, but you know other things like miscanthus have wider distributions. Things like energy cane over here on the right, right, have very limited distribution. You can only grow this in the very far south, uh, southeast of the US. Okay, so that's where willow fits in. Willow is one of these energy crops that could contribute a couple hundred million tons a year towards that billion ton goal here in the United States. So let me tell you a little bit about willow now. So willow's been around for a long time. Native Americans understood and knew all about willow. They used it for all sorts of things, everything from it Tim, we just lost your vocal. And Peter, I, I think we've lost Tim altogether too. Maybe he's dialing back in. 
We see him, we just can't hear him. You can see Tim, but we can't hear him. Okay, can you hear me again? Yes. 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 Yep. Whatever, whatever you did, Tim, don't do it again. <laughs> can anybody hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. we can hear you. So, so, Tim, we missed everything you were going to say or were saying about this particular chart. Okay, so, uh, so I, I was not hearing you. I had the wrong thing. So you can hear me now? Is that, am I, are we back connected? Yes. Okay, yep. great. Sorry about that. I don't know why it disconnected, but there it is. So anyhow, Native Americans, long history using willow, right? They understood the value of the plant. Interesting history. So this map on the left is from a 1904 publication from the U.S. Forest Service showing where they understood willow was being grown in the United States for baskets, with the dark areas being high concentrations of where this basket industry was being run. Onondaga County, in, this, in the data they have in this report, Onondaga County produced more willow baskets than any other county they had data for in the early 1900s. And you can actually go around and find, there's quite a history of it. There's actually some old plantings. There's one out in Casanova I've done some work on and there's various ones scattered around. In Liverpool, New York, on the north side of Syracuse, you can drive around and see barns, um, what are now garages, but they're, these, they're odd looking because of these garages that are like one and three quarter story high. Those are old willow barns, right? Where all the willow used to be stored up at top. And then in the wintertime, you'd bring it down and process it into baskets. So lots of history around here with willow. It's not necessarily new on the landscape, but uh, what we're doing with it is kind of different. There's been work at ESF on willow since the early 1980s. So these two fellows, colleagues of mine that actually got me into willow, Ed White in the top right and Larry Abrahamson in the bottom, right? Uh, really started the willow work here in the Northeast United States. They heard about it from colleagues in Sweden who have about been doing it 15 years before we started, right? And then sort of brought it over here and started adapting and adjusting to the system here. So how do we do it? What is the system that's been developed to grow willow first as an energy crop? So this diagram sort of summarizes that. You take a, a marginal piece of ag land. Again, we don't really want to be growing this stuff on top quality ag land. We've got lots of other demands on that land, right? For food, other fiber, supporting animal systems, right? Lots of things that need to be done with the land. So but it's the lower quality land that's the place to make use of. You prepare the site, right? Much like you would if you were going to plant a traditional crop. You need to control the weeds and prepare your seed bed. You plant it, and I'll show you some blow ups of these in a minute. It grows for a year and then you cut it down. So, one of the beauties about shrub willow is that it sprouts back, it keeps coming back. And so, this cutting down or what we call coppicing turns it into more of a bush. You can see this is coming back after cutting, it's bushy. And then you let it grow. And the stuff, one of the advantages of it is it grows really quickly on the right, in the right conditions. Typically let it grow for three years and you come in and harvest it, right? We've worked with New Holland Agriculture, developed a harvesting system where it cuts it, chips it, pulls the chips into the wagon. This sprouts back and grows again, another, another three years, cut it again. We can run seven of these three year crop cycles. The reality is the folks in Sweden say you could do 10. Um, I'm a little conservative. The oldest planting trials we have are uh, just at the end of their eighth rotation. So I'm still saying seven I'm comfortable with, but we probably can go longer. So if you put it in the ground, right, it's there for 20 to 25 years, depending upon how many of these rotations we run. Okay, and then you're producing biomass off here out of each of these harvests. This is what it looks like. Uh, shrub willow is propagated vegetatively, so from, from parts of the plant, from vegetative or, or parts of the plant. Here's this planter that we use. You take stems of willow, you feed them into the back. It cuts off an eight inch section of stem and pushes it into the ground. When it's in the ground, this is ideal of what you'd like in, in a crop planting situation. Right, so you have maybe half an inch here above ground and the rest of that eight inches is in below ground. Here's what it looks like in the field. We have adopted a system, largely it was developed originally in Europe where you have two rows close together 
And so when you bring a harvester in or a tractor to do weed control or fertilizer, you straddle this one set of tires here, one set of tires here, you straddle that double row. So if you're harvesting, you'd cut one double row at a time. If you're doing other management, you straddle it so you're not driving over the plants. This is what it might look like uh, partway through a first growing season. Okay, then we cut it back and it sprouts back. So here, these are here really to illustrate the bushy nature of this plant after you cut it down. So that's something we should talk about at a finesse book, whether we wanna let it grow another year or coppice it this year, that'll depend upon the growth rate and I'll comment on, on that in a couple of minutes. So it sprouts back and grows quickly. This is one year old after coppicing. So the root system on this plant is two years old, Right? But it grew for you, we cut it down, and then it sprouted back. And this is not uncommon to get five to eight feet of growth on this stuff when it comes back from uh, being cut down or harvested. So it grows very quickly. There's three-year-old willow. So this is actually up in northern New York in Cape Vincent. Uh, this is some plots down in Tully. Uh, these are some plots over near Walcott, New York. So this stuff grows quickly. Right? You can see here a double row beside this fellow. So this has been cut off. This double row has been cut off. Right? So these sections have been harvested. This field is in the process of being harvested. That would be one of the next rows to go. Okay, there's this harvester. Right, So I, I could tell lots of interesting stories about developing a harvesting system for a crop that people that's relatively new. Uh, I'll say that's working, working with New Holland was, was and continues to be a wonderful experience. They were, the people there were just wonderful to work with. So these are available. There's two of them running in New York State at the moment. Uh, I think there's probably six or eight of them running in Europe, harvesting willow crops over there. So there's not a lot of them around, but, you know, if you really wanted to buy one and you had the whole unit all together is probably somewhere around half a million dollars for the forage harvester and the cutting head. You could call your New Holland dealer and they would be more than happy to sell you one. So they, there is a production version that New Holland has uh, and, and sells on the market. This is just a picture up at the old Lionsdale biomass plant uh, that's now been shut down. But this is how they used to unload wagon loads, uh, truck loads of chips. So this is a truck dumper. Uh, you load the, you drive back the truck onto that, you disconnect and drive the cab away, uh, and you lift, literally lift the trailer up and dump the chips into the hopper that then get moved into these piles. This plant was producing renewable power <clears throat> for a long time and eventually sort of reached the end of its life. And then some changes in renewable energy credits in New York State meant it no longer was viable. There is another plant running up at Fort Drum. Uh, they converted an old coal plant and that's where most of the willow being grown in New York is going to now as an energy source. Okay, so again, after you cut it, this is sort of halfway through the growing season after it was harvested. Here you can see it sprouting and growing back. So yield is key, right, in these systems as it is in many agricultural systems, right? You wanna, you wanna optimize your yield optimize it in terms of, I, I, I don't say maximize because you don't want to push it to the maximum if you have to put lots and lots of inputs, lots of extra fertilizer and those kind of things that are going to have added costs and potential environmental impacts. So you want to optimize, you want to get the best growth on the sites that you're working on. So we've done lots of trials. This is a picture of a trial where we have 30 different varieties of willow growing in this trial, right? And it's really designed to pick out the best. You can see clearly like this black hole, this plot has largely died off. So we don't want that. You want the ones that are bigger, right? And so we've done these kinds of trials. Uh, here's a network of them that we ha had a few years ago, all across the Eastern and into the Mideast <coughs> US. And based on this data, we can create these kind of maps to give you an estimate of the kinds of yields you can get in different places. So the, the willow we work with is not gonna grow in the Southeast, right? This is really willow that's adapted to the more temperate climates here in the Northeast. And this range is gonna change going forward, right? These Southern regions are gonna become too hot 
uh, in the years to come with climate change for the will of writers we have uh, to work here. But they work well also up into Canada, they're growing them in Quebec, Southern Ontario, and out in the Western Canada, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. So where are we at with willow as an energy crop? There's about 1,200 acres now in New York, and it's been at that level now for eight or nine years. Uh, that scale up occurred because the USDA had a what was called the Biomass Crop Assistance Program to help landowners put these crops in the ground by helping to pay for some of the establishment and planning costs. So that's what prompted this. Here's the network. So here's Lake Ontario, Cape Vincent. Here's the Thousand Islands US border. So the green dots show you where the willow was planted by landowners. So this is not, so ESF is not managing these. We work with landowners and help to answer questions and help with harvesting sometimes and those kind of things. These were set up to go, here's that Lionsdale plant that was on the edge of the Tug Hill. Uh, and so some of the willow was going in there, some of it was going here to the uh, Black River plant that's on the Fort Drum Army base. This is now, the, all the willow goes here, right? So some added costs for these folks down here because it's a little bit further haul, but they are burning all the willow that's grown and, and have agreed to buy all the willow that landowners can grow. They, the folks here actually said they'd like more willow. It works well in their boiler. They've not ever figured out what exactly it's doing in there, but it tends to lower their emissions and, and give them a little bump in efficiency. I, when I say little bump in efficiency, I'm talking half a percent to a percent. Um, so they quite like it um, and it works well in that system. Turning it into electricity is probably not the best use for any woody biomass, but that's the system that's there in place in terms of our marketplace at this point in time. So this is at uh, one of those plants. This is actually at the old Lionsdale plant. Here's their forest residue, right? So chips from the forest. Here's their willow pile. This sort of gives you an idea. Willow is probably at the Fort Drum Army base, 1%, one percent, one and a half percent of their annual fuel supply. So it's a small piece, but uh, they're happy with it and it works. Lots of other benefits associated with willow. Uh, so we have very low, actually negative greenhouse gas emissions from this system. Again, the plant is taking up the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And yes, we cut off the top, the wood there and the carbon goes off to some energy production and the CO2 goes back to the atmosphere. But you, this whole root system and there's a whole increase of below ground carbon that occurs that actually ends up storing quite a bit of carbon that stays there on the site. So we can actually produce biomass that can be turned into energy, heat or biofuels or uh, heat and electricity that has a negative carbon footprint. So when we start looking at the carbon challenge and the fact that we still want energy, those two things combined, right? actually are quite appealing. Now the economics don't work very well at this point in time, but if we're gonna pay for carbon, then that would change the dynamic. There's lots of wildlife that is supported in Willow. So one of the things that was interesting is the folks in the lab of ornithology uh, 15 years ago did studies in Willow plots that we were scaling up and they got all excited because Willow fills this niche on the landscape where we used to have uh, ag land that was converting to shrub land that was then on its way to forest. We don't have much of that anymore. A lot of that conversion has occurred. And so there's a lack of this shrub land community for birds that are dependent on it. And Willow does a very good job filling that niche. And so um, the bird diversity in the Willow plantings is higher than they had expected, right? And it's similar to natural shrublands uh, or forest systems. Okay, I'm gonna skip these graphs. Uh, we can come back to them. It's greenhouse gas data that I just showed you about in more detail, but in, in the interest of time, I wanted to get to Vaness book. So the idea with some of these other plantings is where can we grow willow for energy and also target other uh, issues? So um, buffers, riparian buffers is one place. Here. These are landowners we worked with in central New York to put willow buffers here along the side of their cornfield to take up 
uh, nutrients and minimize sediment that was running into the creek that's in behind this. You could harvest this and take this off for energy at the same time as doing the nutrient management part of it. The planting at Vanessa Brooks is not, you know, was never envisioned or intended to be harvested for energy. That was not the plan. It was really put in to help stabilize that section uh, along the book, right, to mitigate uh, erosion when, when the book is up and to help with nutrient and sediment, uh, stopping nutrient sediments moving into Vaness Brook. So it's, that's not, it was not planted or designed for energy applications. It's really being used because of its rapid growth and the root system. Um, so we planted two varieties out there, a Salix purpurea variety. These are, for the folks who are out there, those are the ones that were painted red. The white ones that were painted white that Carl so nicely color-coded for us was Salix aerocephala, so two different varieties back in mid-April. Uh, this is sort of an early July picture. Uh, these are from early July. I had students that went back out uh, the second week of August and looked at things again, um, they forgot to take pictures. It's funny, it's, I, I, was, I said, really, students with phones that have cameras with them all the time forgot to take pictures. I said, yeah, we, we were so excited looking at the landscape that they forgot pictures. But uh, here's the story of what's happening. Survival seems to be very good. So there, this is a walkthrough, right? They didn't stop and set up plots and count plants at this point. We, we may do that in the fall. It's somewhere around 90%. So, you know, nine out of 10 of these sticks that put it, that we put in the ground are growing. Uh, and so that's good. Uh, there's a, there are a few patches where it's a little lower and the survival is not as good. And that probably has to do with how different uh, sites on that bit of land were managed in the past is what my guess is. So growth is not anywhere as, you know, like what I showed you in some of those previous pictures. Growth here is is slow, uh, but the soil there is pretty high clay content. And so my experience in growing on heavy clay or high co clay content soils is that the plant is spending a lot of time building a root system in that environment uh, and not as much time building above ground system. My experience on high, cl high clay content soils with willow is slow growth at the beginning and onset in the first one to two years and actually better growth on those soils uh, beyond that, uh, because there's a lot more nutrient and water holding capacity in those types of soils than there is in a lot of other soils. So this is a little slower than I would have expected for <clears throat> a clay site, but I think that's the nature of this location. The key is survival is good, the plants are growing. Uh, and if they're growing through the end of the season, they will, they'll come back next year and they'll continue growing it. It is unlikely we get very much or any winter kill uh, if, they're, if they're growing through the season. Okay, so that's sort of the update on where that sits uh, out there. So it looks good and I think uh, it'll play the role we want it to. I think we at some point should have a conversation about whether to coppice it this winter. I think based on, I'll go out there sometime, but based on the slower growth I might hold off and wait uh, another year and let it grow uh, and let it have another year before we sort of cops it and turn it into a more bushy system. But we can assess that in the fall. You know, other folks have put these willow plantings instead of the edge of the field. This is a trial actually out in Indiana where they put it in the middle of a cornfield to mitigate nitrate uh, problems because it was running into the creek and ultimately running down into the Gulf of the Mississippi, right? So they have nutrient loading restrictions and they reduced, you can see then the subsurface nitrate levels. Here's what it was uh, a year after planting. And then as the willow grew, it actually reduced nitrate levels in the soil compared to the cornfield by 80%. So a few strips in a cornfield made a huge difference in the amount of nitrate that was moving offsite from this corn crop. But, but Tim, uh, this is Dana, just pause on that for a second. So would a willow planting like this or the one at, at Van Ness um, after a period of years need to be replaced? I'm thinking about your seven or eight years of crop rotation, so to speak, or are these willows in for the long run? 
Yeah, so for, for a place like this at Vaness Brook, I think the idea, my understanding is I would just let them go. And if there was not a need to harvest them for some product, right? If people didn't want willow cuttings or whips or people are doing all sorts of things with willow now, making walls and fences and stuff out of willow. But I would just let this grow, Dana. These are shrubs. And so they're going to occupy the site. They're probably going to live effectively for 20 to 30 years. And then what's going to happen is the things are going to seed in around them, right? So trees are going to seed in and you're going to get uh, a succession process. One way to think about it is what the willow will do is accelerate the front end of that succession process by giving you lots of growth and vegetation on the site very, in a very short period of time. And then the successional process that a planting like this would take over and you'd get other, other plants and trees coming in over time. Okay, good. Thanks, thanks, Jim. Yep. Okay. Um, I mentioned before, lots of pollinators. We had a, a student did a very interesting study. They found 57 different species of bees using willow. One of the things that's interesting is willow flowers very early in the spring. And so when I talk to bee experts, they get excited because, oh, this could be a way to help with early vigor of bees um, before there's lots of other plants out, right? And, and strengthen the colony and community uh, with a source of food early on, right? When it's a little more uncertain what else is gonna be out there flowering. The other thing that's interesting is that there's a fellow at Cornell that was part of this work and he looked at the list of speed bees and he go and he was really surprised on how closely the overlap was with the bees that they count on to pollinate apples. So, you know, we started saying, well, maybe we should be planting willow on field edges around apples to support bees. So lots of those kind of ideas and conversations, we haven't gotten around to trying them out, but this was sort of a very interesting find and not, I think, certainly not what I expected and not what the bee uh, experts were expecting either. Okay, we do other things, living snow fences on the side of highways. They make great living snow fences. You can see it capturing snow here along I-81, remediation of old industrial sites. We can take wastewater from uh, wastewater treatment systems and rural areas and put it on to willow and process nutrients, lots of other things that we're doing uh, with willow. I will stop there um, and, and am happy to answer questions if people have them. Sorry, I talked a little longer. Hard to get faculty members to talk less than 50 minutes at a time. Jim, uh, excellent job. Uh, it, very, very interesting. I, I and I, I would guess the rest of us learned a great deal. Um, questions, everybody, please. Jim, just a question on your, one of your original screens showed CO2 being captured and then stored underground. Am I correct in that? Yes, this idea of BECS, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. Yeah. Has, has that been proven out? Has, has anybody tested that? Yes. So there's, uh, there are lots of smaller demonstrations of that. One of the biggest ones now is actually at a plant in, in the UK, Drax, the Drax power plant. They're, they're these massive power plants in central England that used to run on coal and they're now run on wood pellets. Uh, and they have set up a carbon capture and storage system. That's probably the largest one that's occurring at a bioenergy carbon capture and storage system. And there's a lots of smaller ones across the landscape. So you need to be in certain areas. So in New York, for example, southern tier, the southern tier of New York has the right geology, right, where you could store carbon below ground. The Adirondacks, that granite sort of landscape, not so much, not so much, not the kind of place you want to try and do that, harder to do. Uh, so it will depend upon uh, location and geology to some extent. But yes, they're, they're running. But again, they're not economical. I think if there was a price for carbon, we're at a point where we could scale those up and there are companies that are ready to scale them up, but it doesn't pay right now to go through the process of burying carbon through that kind of a, a system. A, a second question is, what's the ecological impact of burning 
wood, if you will, chips versus uh, coal? Yeah, so emissions from a, a good wood burning system are much lower than they are for coal, generally. Um, certainly the CO2 emissions, so, okay, I've got electricity numbers in my head. I'd have to go look up heat numbers, but let me give you the electricity numbers in terms of carbon dioxide impact. For one kilowatt of electricity from coal, you generate about a thousand grams of CO2. Natural gas is 500, it's 490 something, but it's five, in essence, it's 500 grams of CO2. Um, so lower, uh, a bioenergy system like Willow, and we've done these studies, we're probably in the 50 to 60 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour. So a lot less CO2 emissions and actually, you don't have the issues with uh, mercury and some of the other heavy metals that you have associated with coal. Um, you just don't have those things that are picked up and acquired in any reasonable concentration in wood. Tim, I had a question about, I don't even know how to ask it probably because I know nothing of economics, but if we want to entice more of this to be grown, right? Um, is there, you know, if I had some land and I wanted to grow an energy crop of willow, uh, is it, is, is there, you know, is it sustainable from an economic standpoint to do that? Or is that market just not quite there yet until we get more people using the burn? Yeah, so right now, uh, when people call me and I get these calls regularly, right, I always tell them, first, you need to make sure you have a market. So down here, there isn't a market, right? So, the, you know, Watertown, <laughs> to haul chips to Watertown is gonna cost you about as much as they're gonna pay you for them by the time you get there. And then you gotta pay for your farming operation. So it's not, you can't make money right now. There's two things in play. You know, electricity prices are relatively low. So the price of wood chips to make electricity is relatively low. Um, and then the other thing, I'd say the other thing that I've commented is there's no cost on carbon. Taking wood and turning it into electricity uh, not a very efficient process, right? We're talking 25 to 30% conversion efficiency. If we think about wood, right? We take CO2 to the atmosphere, you drive with sunlight. The compounds that are in wood, uh, you know, it's biomass that gets converted into coal, heat and pressure over time, right? Or biomass gets converted into oil, it's heat and pressure over time. The compounds, the complicated compounds, particularly in things like petroleum, right? They're in wood. The plant has already made them. The problem is they're not concentrated. So what we really need to do, and there's lots of people, engineers and people much brighter than I am working on this conversion process. So there are processes we can take wood and turn it into what's called a bio oil. It's an oil-like product, right? Biologically based. That process is called pyrolysis. So I, Pyro, right? Fire or heat, lysis, break it. So you're breaking up the wood with heat, really, in a very fast, short period of time with some pressure, and you turn it into a bio oil. It's like making oil, but we're not, we don't have a couple million years to do it. Those, the value of those oils is much higher. The problem is the market is not developed, right? This is where, as we make this transition, those, that bio oil could go in to be made into renewable diesel. It could be made into uh, asphalt type products, right? Instead of using petroleum, it could be, it would take a couple of more steps. My chem, I know I'm not the chemical engineer to do it, but my colleagues tell me, yep, you could take that bio oil and turn it into a sustainable jet fuel, for example. People are going to pay more for that, right? We, you, landowners need to get paid more than what they're getting paid for for wood chips to make electricity, right? In order to make it an economic process. Sorry, that was a long answer. Right now, it's not economic. And when landowners call me, I'm just very frank with them. I said, you can grow willow and do things with it. You're not going to make money right now in the market with growth. Good. Thanks. Yeah. And Julie, I had a couple of hopefully short questions. Um, one is, you mentioned um, bees, um, a big number of bees associated with willow. Does is there any studies about butterfly or moth larvae? Other pollinators? 
Not, not that I'm aware of, although there may be in the UK, they've done more studies on those. We have not done those here. Okay. Um, so the I'm next just, question. I'll give you my other reaction to that, Julie, is that from all the time I spent in Willow, I, I'm not used to seeing concentrations of butterflies or moths. If you walk out into a willow plantation at the right time in the spring, right, you, there's a lot of bees around. So it's sort of like, okay, there's some out here. There was a lot more than we expected in terms of diversity. I don't think of them as being places where you get uh, that attract in butterflies and moths. Okay. Well, my next question is um, when they harvest this willow, do they try to time that so they're not harvesting bird nests along with, with the willow cane? Yeah, they so absolutely. So, right. So the ideal time to harvest actually is in the late fall after the leaves have dropped. So you would like right. to turn those nutrients back into the ground, right? And the birds have long fledged. There are some situations. So marginal land in New York is wetland, generally poorly drained land. So some of those landers I showed you up north have had to start harvesting uh, in early September with some leaf matter still on just because come late October, those fields are never dry. And frankly, fields don't freeze like they used to. We used to, when I started this work, we'd always count on fields being frozen. You could put equipment and go run around and do what you needed in the wintertime. You, you can no longer, even up on the Tug Hill, you cannot count on land being frozen anymore in the wintertime. Wow. But no, um, spring harvest are a bad idea. For birds yes. particularly, um, right? But for lots of other dynamics in the plant system right. and, and other things that are using them. Yep. So avoid, you, we avoid is the those. Soil windows. exhausted. Okay, thanks. Is this is the soil exhausted after 21 years of willow? Is, does it need to be amended after that, or do they grind the willow back into the soil to start over? Or, um, that's so what seven, happens? Like, yeah. So a couple of components of s soil. So one is carbon. And willow systems build carbon. So think about it, it's just a perennial crop on a landscape. If you take some marginal agricultural land that's even had some infrequent but regular uh, cultivation activity, even if it's once every three or four years, right? That is losing carbon has reached a lower equilibrium. When you put a perennial plant and then you look at the root system of willow, lots of fine roots that are dying and turning over, foliage that's dropping in. We have shown that you build carbon in the soil Oops, we lost you again. Oh, I'm sorry. There, you're back. I think. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Sorry, my headphones uh, keep knocking out. Um, so the other components of soil. So we are taking some nutrients off, uh, and. And so you, you do probably want to replace them. If you didn't replace nutrients over time, some decline in Kim, we were hearing you pretty well, but maybe you're frozen right now. Nitrogen and potassium in this region are nutrients you want to watch. We've got lots of phosphorus in our systems here. From our agricultural system, not a problem over time. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the last one is kind of segueing from what Dave was asking. So we're ALA, we're trying to work with farmers and other landowners to encourage. And after, I'm sure you heard, maybe it happened to you too, where you are, we had seven and almost a half inches of rain in, in one and a half days, two weeks ago. Um, a, lot of, a lot of damage. Um, so if we're trying to encourage farmers or other landowners to plant willow, what would be our argument? And, and I know some farmers are trying to plant their corn and their soybeans right up to the edges of streams that they've straightened and um, they don't want to lose a single foot. Um, Todd Demond was unusual and then he gave us a, gave up a hundred feet, uh, right, to put these willows in. Um, is there some kind of resource you could point us towards so we could say, well, we have this little sheet here that shows you something, <laughs> something with some numbers on it that would encourage people to maybe give up a little, even, you know, not a hundred feet, but some, I, I know when we're trying to, um, our county is trying to amend the rules and regulations for the watershed. 
And one of the sticking points seemed to be requiring buffers of some depth around water going through property. And the farmers were like, I think they were, was it 30 feet we were? Uh, the yeah, uh, draft yeah, is significant. 30 or 35 feet. And the farmers yeah. were saying, no, no, six or less. You know, So they were, you know, it's going to be grudging giving up a single foot. And I, I can't argue with that. So what, what can we say to help make it not quite so un, unpalatable, I guess? Yeah, so you know the farmers I've worked with over the years, it's it's the same debate, right? Back and forth, right? They lose land. Um, you know, one of the things that's made a difference if you have these severe events and you get a washout in a part of your field and the stream takes out a chunk of your field, that's a good time I've found to talk to farmers because you know now let's have a conversation about stabilizing the stream bank, both for your benefit. Yes, you're gonna have to give up a little bit of space. But the impacts you're going to have uh, with these events, and, and frankly, these extreme events, I think, are what we're going to be living with from climate change going into the future. And so let's try and build resiliency into your system to protect the resource that you have, right? right? It'll also protect the stream and the, and the lake, right? And there's lots of those other benefits associated with it. But if it can get tied back into... We understand you don't want to give up space, but if the stream's going to take the space, maybe you want to think about doing something to stabilize that now um, as opposed to later. You know, there are programs and, and some farmers just, so that, you know, the NRCS, and I'm sure you folks have probably had conversations around CRP or CREP type programs where farmers can get assistance. The New York State tree, the DEC has a tree for tribs program. Mm -hmm. that will help us sit, pay uh, some compensation to landowners uh, for that land. So CRP, for example, will pay you an annual rental rate for the agricultural land that is taken out of production and put into willow or trees or grasses along the stream side. Right? One of the challenges is if you're taking 30 feet and you think about how long along a stream you have to get a few acres, um, and you're getting 50 bucks an acre from the USDA, the amount of paperwork the USDA makes you do, frankly, it's painful. Um, and if you're only making, so say you've got five acres in buffers, right? And they're gonna pay you $250 a year. One of the challenges is that it's become so complicated that farmers kind of go, it is not worth the paperwork headache for $250. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some way to streamline that. And, and I'm not, that would be a good conversation to have with the, NRCS folks in your county or the Soil Water Con Conservation District, they might be able to help streamline that, right? I think that's what the Trees for Tribs DEC program tries to do. Find willing landowners. That program deals with a lot of the paperwork stuff, right? So it's just really getting landowners to agree to a planting. I, the, is that what you're looking for, the kind of things. Those yes, are my sort you. of experiences working with farmers. We did a bunch down at the south end of um, Atisco Lake, stream bank plantings along the side. Uh, very interesting interactions with the farmers down there. Um, you know, eventually they did it, right? And they understood the value of it. There was also, there was a regulatory hat, uh, hammer being held over them. Um, that probably influenced that system. But I think once they saw them and experienced them, I think they saw the value associated with them. That, that's the other thing I would say, Julie, is if you can find one farmer that tries it and has success, the best, I think the best person to talk to the other farmers is the farmers that have tried it, right? And have sort of seen the value of it. I was, I'm worried that some of those willows washed away and all this. I, don't, I didn't hear what happened to the nest brook, but so when was your, that was like mid-August, we had heavy rains in the second, maybe the second week of August, it was around then? Yes. Okay, yeah, my students were probably out before that. Well, I'll send somebody out to have a look at it again and see what it looks like. It was like the 20th of August. Oh, that late? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so Tim, uh, we've managed to use up a, a majority of your evening. Anyone else have a pressing question? Speak now, please. Uh, Tim, one more question. Um, and that is, are there any benefits to the nutrient uptake of willows? I ask this because one time 
I watched an experiment where they're using Phragmites in like gray water. And the concept was the nutrients go up, and up into the Phragmites and then cut it down and haul it away from wherever. Is that same thing hold for willows? Yeah. Be- yes, we, we can do the same thing. And the place where that probably got the greatest benefit, Peter, is in small rural communities that have some sort of wastewater but don't have a tertiary back-end wastewater treatment system. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that we have one one of these plantings that we that a landowner put in up in Cape Vincent is literally across the gravel road from a brand new wastewater treatment facility. They built a whole concrete section that was supposed to be filled with weeds, phragmites, and some other things to do that gray water treatment. They could never get it permitted, and we've had lots of conversation. It's like let's pump it onto the willow. Right? They do this in Europe in lots of small towns, uh, in the UK, Ireland, France, Germany. The challenge is, so these are these regulatory issues. The challenge is when I talk to the DEC regulators, they go, you want to put it on what? I said, Willow. It's not in the book. It's not in the regulatory book. Willow is not permitted. There's, you know, they've got grasses and phragmites and lots of other things. And then I try and have the conversation. It's like, okay, can we get a trial permit to try it and tell us what data you want us to collect and, and we'll try and show you that it works. It's like, ah, it's not in the book, too complicated. So I often find these things, it's like your question, Julie, it's, it's you know, we've got, we can understand the biology and the technology, the people part of these systems, I think more, the more I work at this is like, that's the biggest challenge, right? Is getting everybody together to see the common value to move these systems forward. But yes, Peter, the. Sh- that's a long answer to your question. The short answer is yes, you can do the same thing with willow and it works very well. Willow is an inefficient user of water. So it pumps lots of water off, which means any nutrients in the water are getting pulled up into the plant. Thank you. Yeah. Tim, I just, I just one, one question, Tim, that reminds me sort of um, where they are using willow as uh, wood, wood for burning. In, for power generation or whatever. So those willow chips has to be dried, I assume, for a substantial amount of time, or is it dry out pretty quick? So the facilities that are like up at Fort Drum, they burn green wood chips. They've designed their system to handle both green wood out of the forest or willow. Wow. So you will get the initial, so willow, all, all wood comes off forest residues, Willow is not much different than any other wood. It's coming out of the forest. About 40 to 50% of the weight is water. So if you cut down a tree and lift up a section of wood that's fresh, half of that weight is water as a rule of thumb. Same with willow. So you can get some initial drying, especially if the way we cut it and chip it. We have found that we can be down to the low 40s or the high 30s by the time you blow it. It sits in a pile for a few days. You load it in a truck and you take it there and dump it out. Hmm. Assuming it doesn't get rained on with seven and a half inches of rain <laughs> or any, any substantial amount of rain. Sure. But they, they'll handle, they can, um, those systems will use wet wood chips. They're designed specifically to, to burn as efficiently as possible with those. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay, everybody, are we satisfied that we've pestered Dr. Volk sufficiently? If so, Tim, thank you so much. Great talk. Um, Lots of knowledge conveyed, lots of things that at least I didn't know. And uh, we continue to appreciate working with you and and being around uh, your projects and what what all you're up to. Great, well, thanks for the opportunity to share with you. a couple of things, Dana, I, I will, we will go out and have a look at the situation out there at Vanessa Book uh, and just I'll send you an email with an update and when we go and assess and then we can talk about what to do in the fall. Okay. You had a question about American chestnut, right? If you wanted, if your group yeah. was interested in that and wanted to hear, right, there's folks here at ESF that I'm sure I could probably convince somebody to come and give you a bit of a presentation on chestnut and what they're doing. Or if there's other things up here at ESF that you hear about that you know, you want a connection to that would come and talk with your group, let me know. I'm happy to make connections. Thank you very much, Tim. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening now, everybody. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.